Holy One, you have promised to be with us. Long ago, you sent your Son to abide amongst us and to guide us to a future of goodness and hope. And still now, you remain with us, O God. Let us feel your presence warming our lives. We seek to know more of your truth, your justice, your kindness. Fill these desires with, of our hearts this morning. Amen. Our prophet for this morning is Haggai. His words are recorded in a very short book, only two chapters long. The context is this. We've talked about the destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BCE, some 2,600 years ago. At that time, the temple was destroyed. The glorious temple that Solomon had built burnt to the ground. Many of the people were taken into exile and lived in a refugee camp near Babylon. Times changed. The Persian Empire rose to power. They had a more humane approach to refugees and territories in their empire, and they allowed the refugees from Jerusalem to return home. They gave them a permit to rebuild the temple. The Persians even returned some of the loot that they had taken from the temple. The people who returned had glorious visions, but the reality was much harder. They had to re-establish a government, sort out relations with the people who had left, been left behind in the land, and operate with limited resources. The task of rebuilding the temple seemed formidable. They lost heart. Time flowed by. A year. A decade. Haggai's words date to about 520. He encourages the people to get on with the job. Though they do not have the resources to rebuild the temple to its original magnificence, Haggai tells them that the glory of the temple does not reside in the magnificence of the building, but in the magnificence of the God for whom it is built, the Lord of hosts. In fact, you'll notice in this the repetition of the title, the Lord of hosts, in today's reading. It's characteristic of this small book. Haggai contains about 5% of the occurrences of the term, even though the book is only two chapters, which is 0.02%. That's a good one to remember for trivia night, you know, how long. What percentage of the Bible is taken up with the book of Haggai? And you say, I know, 0.02% of the Bible. Thanks, Kevin. Haggai. In the second year of King Darius... In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judea, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you? that has saw his ha this house in its former glory. How does it look to you now? Is it not your sight has nothing, as nothing? Yet now take courage, O Zerubbabel, said the, says the Lord. Take courage, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the promise that I have made you, came out of Egypt. My spirit abides among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once again, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake the nations so the treasure of all nations shall come and I will fill this house with splendour, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendour of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. 
If you read all the rest of the book of Haggai, you'll find that Haggai believed that building the temple would ensure prosperity, that somehow, magically, a house for God would create good harvests and bring riches into the country, ensuring success. Do you believe that? I don't. It's not the temple, or in our case, the church building, that automatically brings success. The building does not count for most in God's eyes. It is the community that is built around the building and what that community does that counts more. However, I wonder if Haggai was onto something. The situation after the return was difficult. The people struggled to re-establish the society. They were disheartened. Each looked to their own interests. Haggai encouraged them to look to God. That was their first step in recovery. To look to the God of the Exodus whose promise to the people of Moses' time did not fail and whose spirit stayed with them. To look to God. To give God a place in their rebuilt city. To turn attention away from themselves alone and their own struggles. And once they had looked to God, they could look to others. Haggai was not just concerned about the construction of a building. The building, the temple, was symbolic of something much bigger. Haggai was building a community, a community that focused first on God. He wanted to move the people from each looking only at themselves to looking at God and then to looking at others. Why have a temple at all if it is not a place to worship God and from there to serve others? to love God first and then to love others. We're going to move to our reading from Luke. It's a story about a conversation between Jesus and some Sadducees. So let me give you a little background to the Sadducees. Judaism at the time of Jesus had various religious factions. One group was the Sadducees. Their faith was very traditional. They accepted the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, which it believed, or which they believed, had been written by Moses. They did not accept any of the newfangled ideas that had crept into the religion over the course of centuries, for instance, from Persian influences. And one, idea, one of these ideas was that of resurrection. The early faith of Israel did not have an afterlife to speak of. There was a place called Sheol, but it was a place of non-existence and non-feeling. If life is feeling, then death, non-life in Sheol is not feeling anything. Resurrection, the Sadducees argued, was an important thing, so much so that if it were true, then surely God would have told Moses about it. But the books of Moses do not mention resurrection, so the Sadducees dismissed it. Sociologically, the Sadducees were a very powerful force in society. They were the rich elite, the landed, with landed wealth and hereditary status in the priestly class. They controlled the temple and were well placed in government. For such a group, it was important that the family line continue. This was the responsibility of the family. After the temple was destroyed and by the Romans in 70. AD, that's about 600 years ago, after Haggai, the Sadducees vanished from the scene. The future of the religion belonged to other, the other major party, the Pharisees, and among them, the early Christians. Lack of belief and resurrection in the resurrection and the need to continue the family line lie behind what the Sadducees ask Jesus about. Thanks. Some of the Sadducees, who's, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up the children for his brother. Now there are seven brothers... The first married 
and died childless. The second and the third married her, and in so the same way all seven died childless. Finally the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die any more, because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. He is God not of the dead, but of the living, for in him all them are alive. Our passage from the Gospel of Luke for this Sunday is quite a puzzle. It starts with a question about the resurrection, in fact, whether there is such a thing, and ends with the verse I just read, which is about continual life. Jesus, you may have noticed, did not say that Abraham, Isaac or Jacob died and were resurrected, but they are alive in God. Resurrection is a difficult topic to get a handle on. Is it a meaningful event in history or is it more of a spiritual event in the believer? The arguments are complex, not just simple assertions for or against a literal reading of the Bible, but careful explorations of the nuances of the concept of resurrection. I know with conversation, from conversations with many of you that you've wrestled with the concept of resurrection, as have I. Clearly, as our reading today shows, the idea has created problems for quite a while from even before the death of Jesus. The Sadducees, for one thing, did not think the resurrection made sense and engaged Jesus on this topic. I've mentioned before that the contributors to our Bible delighted in exaggeration. Our story is yet another example of that. One woman married successively to seven brothers. One after another they died before she had children before she could have children with them. I wonder how the woman might have felt being handed on like a used car in vain in the vain attempt to preserve the family line. I also wonder why the siblings did not cease earlier. You would have thought that by number three or four they would have figured out that the situation was hopeless and tried some other means of reproductive therapy. The story exaggerates to make a point. Today, with our modern practicality, we would probably simply pitch it in terms of a person, a widow or a widower, who had two happy marriages and then ask how that person would choose a partner in heaven. And we would add another question or other questions to this one about the nature of the resurrected person. What about disability or sickness? What would be the age of the one resurrected? Would a baby be resurrected a baby or an old person at the age of their death? Incidentally, this has occurred in thought before and Augustine answered that question by saying that in the resurrection everyone would be 33 because that was the age of Jesus at his resurrection. So if somebody asks you how old you are and you, you really don't want to say, don't do the 28 bit, just say 33 because that's the age you'll be according to St. Augustine. The questions add up to make resurrection seem at best a mystery and at worst nonsensical. It would be really great to have answers to such things, but in my experience, convincing answers are lacking. We have little or no experience of what happens after death. At best, some honest people report experiences of a presence 
identifiable as another person or God. Only charlatans go into further details. So the Sadducees have a good point. How does Jesus answer them? The first thing to note is that he dismisses the question in, quite, in fact quite abruptly. He doesn't talk about the nature of the resurrection body. He simply states that marriage is something that holds this side of death and not the other. And you can almost hear the Pharisees in the crowd who are the opponents of the Sadducees applauding at that point. For the Sadducees, marriage and the production of children were vitally important because they were embedded in a hereditary system and started out with the assumption that there was no resurrection. So without stable, controlled marriage with offspring, a person had no future. Without a resurrection, who would remember them, if not the generations in this world? Jesus then gives a simple reply. God remembers. He phrases it in terms of Moses and the Torah, things that the Sadducees would accept. Moses, says Jesus, refers to people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, people whom the world thought were dead, as if they were alive in God's eyes. And that, suggests Jesus, is the essence of resurrection, not worrying about husbands and wives, but being alive in God. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. In God, all are alive. Jesus doesn't give any further information of the sort we would like about the nature of this resurrected life. Whether we spend our lives on clouds with harps or whether, as some theologians suggest, we live in the, on in the memory of God and in the ripples and the eddies our life on earth has created. Whether there is a judgment for the wicked with a hell, nothing is said about these things. The words of Jesus show us something of the nature of God. God is, in essence, life. God is completely alive, alive so much that in God there is no trace of death. An event which we might term the death of Abraham is not an event at all for God. The essence of God is life for all people. By contrast, we tend to equate being alive with not being dead. In God, there is only the first of these. We see death as a barrier. It seems to be part of our nature to construct walls and barriers that include some and exclude others. The ultimate barrier in our perception is death, a thing that happens that it appears to us, separates us completely from another person in ways that race or gender or bad breath do not. In God's eyes, this death is nothing. It's not a barrier in the same way as those other walls we build are not barriers to God's love. We are currently alive and we will continue to be alive after this thing we call death because we will be alive in God. In fact, one might argue that we are already alive in God. So our life continues taking different shapes at different times. Resurrection is not so much an event, but a state. A state of living in God, who is life itself. God is life. With this in mind, let's take another quick look at the words from the prophet Haggai. The people had returned from exile, but conditions were hard. Harvests poor and the rebuilding program slow. They felt a lack of life and became despondent. Haggai, in response, turns their attention to the temple, not so much as a building, but as a place for the presence of God and so the presence of life. He recognizes that the new temple would not look like the old, but that's not the point. A focus on the temple implies a focus on God, which in turn implies a focus on life. Haggai issues a call to life, certainly a life different from before, but life in God nevertheless. God is life. What might this mean for us? If the essence of God is life and we have faith in God, then we have faith in the power of life. We are oriented to life 
new life and life and living as stewards of life. However, we live in a context that is beset by stories that deplete life or deny life. The structures of our society are breaking down and undermining adequate security, adequate health care, housing and so on. The planet is on an ecological slide to extinction. The church as an institution is failing. Christianity is becoming more marginalized. Our uniting church congregations are aging and growing smaller. How should we respond? Do we choose to follow the path of the Sadducees? They focused on marriage purely as a response to death, as a way of ensuring offspring, and not as something that builds community and increases life. Or do we trust in God as a God of life and live into the future with hope, even though we cannot be sure what that future might look like? Jesus, you recall, in the end, redirected the question which the Sadducees had asked about some comical heavenly existence to bring the focus back on the present. So, to the question of resurrection, of the denial of a future for us at Scott's, should be a question about how to live now in the present. That's an open question and we here at Scott's answer it in a different way in some way each time we consider a major decision or even some minor ones so as I thought about an answer to that question I came up with two of our answers that we have made our society in fact any society tends to evaluate people and to write them or some of them off as less important if you like, as having less life than others. It would not be unreasonable to say that many Sadducees regarded others as somehow inferior. Similar evaluations hold in our society. The political rhetoric may express concern for certain groups. The political and economic decisions do not match this rhetoric. For instance, Homeless people are frequently evaluated as somehow inferior. At Scott's, we provide accommodation for the big issue just through that door, a magazine which is sold by homeless people and helps them get income as well as self-esteem. The people who work at the big issue are concerned about the quality of life for these people. On another front, Scots has taken a role in the Uniting Church in the area of care for people with mental health issues, specifically with regard to suicide. The area is far too big for one organisation to manage, but we do a little bit where we can. We care for people whose society tends to ignore or write off. Our concerns, or our concern, reflects God's concern with life and we carry out that concern, we implement that concern as we are able when it comes into our path, into our view. God is a God of life. God is a God of the living. Faith in God is faith in the power of life. And this faith is reflected in our actions. We should be ready to give our lives, our energies for others. Will we run out of life in the process? No way. The source of our life is God, unmeasurable, inexhaustible, inexhaustible, infinite life itself. In God we are truly alive. In God all are truly alive. Amen.